Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, small business people and lovers of good stories in general. Welcome to a Flash episode. This is our second Flash episode of Small Business War Stories. As a reminder, we have our weekly stories where I actually spend time on the road meeting with people face to face, driving around the country and meeting people in their environment and getting their their stories of success, of struggle, their triumphs, their sorrows, everything in our episodes. And we also have these Flash episodes where we bring in experts and interesting people that our audience uh, can probably benefit from or learn something from. And uh, we today have a very, very special guest. His name is Strother Gaines. And he is a very, very interesting guy who is, he calls himself a, unic- a unicorn wrangler, but he's really an entrepreneurial coach and a speaker. And he started a company called But I'm a Unicorn, Damn It. And I met him at a conference where he was doing a talk called How to Network Without Being an Asshole. And I don't want to give anything else away because he is very entertaining and he has a lot of good advice. And we focus on networking and how to be authentic and be yourself and uh, succeed in meeting other people that can uh, benefit your business and hopefully where you can benefit them as well. This episode, this flash episode of Small Business War Stories is brought to you by Proven. Proven.com is a small business, well, it's it started off as a hiring tool for small businesses, and we still do that, and we're turning into a small business information hub where a lot of people are coming to us for knowledge about all kinds of different aspects of running your small business. We have a really, really exciting blog. You can check it out at blog.proven.com where we discuss all different types of uh, challenges that, that small businesses face, and, and, and there's a lot of uh, learning to do there. And you can also check out our hiring tool where you can post a job to over 100 job boards. It's, it works very well for small businesses. It's very simple, and you can collect all of your applicants in one place. And uh, go check it out. There's a free trial. It's proven, P-R-O-V-E-N dot com. Without further ado, I do want to get into today's Flash episode with Strother Gaines from But I Am a Unicorn Damn it. And we are live here, and I am here in Boston, Massachusetts at the HubSpot Inbound Conference, and I have the pleasure today to sit down with Strother Gaines. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And I don't know, I just asked you how I should introduce you. You have so <laughs> many different aspects of you. Today we're going to talk about networking. Mm-hmm. You're, you're an expert on, on networking and how to be successful with that, but you also have, so you have a, a coaching company, correct? Mm-hmm. And what's that called? It's called But I'm a Unicorn, Damn It. I'm, but I'm a Unicorn, Damn It. That's it. And mm-hmm. then there is something related to acting you mentioned? Yeah, so uh, I just actually within the past month have opened a theater company called TBD immersive okay Uh, it's an immersive theater company that does immersive work we're uh, finishing up a show this week back in DC and then we remount in February in the DuPont underground which is uh, an old abandoned uh, basically metro car space underneath the the DuPont circle uh, metro station so it's really exciting very cool and the third one is Uh, network under 40 TBD immersive and unicorn dammit okay the the first one you mentioned now is network under 40 Uh, network under 40 is the networking company that I'm the event director for the DC chapter Uh, so I I run that event. Uh, it's a monthly event in DC for professionals under 40. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Uh, so you did a talk here uh, at uh, HubSpot mm-hmm. Inbound, and, and it was called uh, How to Network Without Being an Asshole. An Asshole. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Sounds good. I like it. So let's uh, let's talk about that. So small, a lot. We have a lot of an audience that's small business owners mm-hmm. and operators, and I think uh, I think it's it's hard to argue that networking is important. Sure. I think it's, you know, people know that it's something that, that is important, but I'm sure you encounter this a lot that people have sometimes, uh, it's uncomfortable for mm-hmm. people to think of themselves as networkers because yeah. networkers often, like even the word can kind of elicit this idea Smarmy of- Smarmy and sleazy yeah, and gross, like yeah. fake. So let's talk, let's talk about that. How do you see networking and what's your approach to it? Yeah, uh, the thing that I usually tell people is focus on creating a relationship as opposed to doing the traditional networking. You know, networking is a term, like you said, gets kind of a bad rap for being smarmy and gross and self-serving. And uh, 
what I try and get people to do is focus more on just meet that person, see where you overlap, see how you can help them. You know, it's a little stereotypical to say, see, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country type sure. thing. Same sort of thing in networking. When people, most people go out to network, especially small business owners, you do it because you need more clients or you want strategic partnerships or something like that. Mm -hmm. You go in with a, uh, a specific desire that you want to accomplish. And sometimes that gets in the way of creating a real and meaningful uh, relationship with people. So you want to try and step in and be a little less tied to the result of, I need you as a client, I need you as a partner, and ask more, who is this person and do I want to get to know them as a human being as opposed to client. Right, so here in between the lines, I'm hearing a lot about hearing and listening and asking. So it's it's maybe more than going and, you know, maybe blasting all your accomplishments in the first yeah. sentence. It's a lot more about asking questions, right? Mm -hmm. how, so how, do you, how do you see that? Yeah, I think lots of people go into networking events and feel like they have to peacock themselves. Yep. They have to say, like, here are my accomplishments. This is what my company has done. This is what I could do for you. These are the things that make me important. And sadly, people just don't really care about that. You know, we want to feel like that's super important and to get validated by someone saying, oh, that's so great. You did this exciting thing or you, you know, saved this much money or, you know, those types of things that we usually use as markers. But realistically, they just want to talk about themselves. And so if we can give people that space to talk about themselves and if you connect with that and you dig something out of them, they're more excited to connect with you later and potentially do business with you. I usually tell people to focus first on the connection and then on the collaboration. Right. So being more long-term greedy. As yeah, opposed absolutely. To I mean, networking is such a long-term game and sometimes people approach it as a short-term build. Okay. So like if I can go and get 10 business cards, then this was a successful event. And that's a terrible marker for how to network. Uh, if I meet one person that I have a legitimate, real connection with, an authentic connection where they know who I am and I know who they are, yeah. Great event. That beats the 10 business cards. 100%. And, and, and the one email follow up and then uh -huh. like the LinkedIn request that kind of. And, like, and now I never look at you ever again. Right. Yeah. Got it. What are some other common mistakes that people make? So maybe maybe that's one is perceiving that, the, you know, the quantity over quality. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some other mistakes that people make? I think people put too much pressure on themselves. Okay. And I think it's what throws people most of the time when they come to a networking event. Uh, the very first time I did a networking event as a coach, I used to be a performer and an actor. And okay. so we're really used to being networking. We're networking all the time because we're selling a product, which is ourselves. Sure. <laughs> so we're always on kind of thing. Yep. Um, when I became a coach, I went to a networking event and drove up in the car, pulled into the, the parking spot, and then burst into tears because I was so intimidated of walking in and having to tell people, like, I am a professional and here's what I do and yep. you should hire me. And I think that people end up putting so much pressure on themselves when they go to these things, they overthink they don't know, they you know lose sort of the normal conversational tone that they have. They put on their work voice and they, I, th I think that people just need to lighten up and realize really everyone's pretty terrible at networking. If yeah. you think you're terrible at networking, <laughs> everyone else is too. Yeah. So once you recognize everyone's bad at this, then it takes a lot of the stress off and it becomes less about, let me make sure this goes right yeah. and let me just be with this person and see who they are and what they're up to. I think a lot of times when you think about um, something being overwhelming or putting pressure on yourself, something that can help is thinking about small wins. Uh -huh. yeah. So what are maybe some small wins uh, if, if somebody is beginning to uh, get into, maybe if they're not, they're not new to networking, but let's say getting into a specific circle, let's say somebody moved to a new town and they're mm -hmm. showing up and meeting people. What are some small wins that people can think of um, in, in the short term that end up accumulating and, and helping you to get be, you know get that long term result? Yeah, the I would say small wins would be you know just showing up to these events in the first place. Yep. Like people have a hard time. You've done a lot of the work just stepping into the door, and so being able to say even if I went to this thing and I didn't meet anyone that really sort of like lights my fire in, in, in any sort of real way. I went out, I put myself out there, I got to sort of find out this is not a place for me. This is either this event isn't a good fit for me or this industry isn't a good fit for me or I need to figure out something. You're just data gathering yep. every time you go to a new event or you interact with a new uh, business type or person type. You're just learning how do I show up in this and what can I pull away from it. So even if you go in and you whiff it and it's just a terrible event and you don't walk away with anything, you've still gained a lot of information on who you are when you walk into that room and how you can either adapt or find another place that it works better for you. Okay, cool. So basically just keep keep showing up. even yeah. just, And seeing the act of showing up is a mm -hmm. win. And the, I think, you know, the more you show up, to, especially if you pick a, a specific event, Okay. You know, Network Under 40, to plug my event a sure. little bit there. Go, go, for go it. to Network Under 40. <laughs> it's really great. Uh, but you do start seeing people over and over and over again. 
Okay. And those people start sort of being touchstones. And so me as the event director, when I see someone that's been to four or five events, someone new comes in and says, oh, I don't know who to talk to. I feel a little awkward. I'm like, oh, we'll go talk to Susan over there. She's been here a couple of times. I know her. I'd recognize her. She's a known quantity for me. Yeah. And as you build that e in either event or industry, I think you can consider that a win. And there's no way that she knows that I think that way about her yet until I go over and specifically say, hey, I send people to you specifically because you've been here a couple times. A lot of event directors or people at a networking event won't do that. And oh, so okay. we, if you continue to show up and you become a face and you become a known quantity, even if they don't tell you, you're still probably winning in that group. Interesting. So just ac accumulating uh, presence and, and mm -hmm. you know, kind of mileage under that. Absolutely. No. Is, that counts. Cool. So do you use assistant? Do you have assistant because uh, if you're you know, successfully networking, you're um, meeting lots of people. Mm -hmm. Even if you're focusing on quality, uh, if you continue to show up, you sure. will continue to. Do you have some kind of a, like a tickler or a system to, that reminds you to stay in touch with people? What is your process for reaching out or for, uh, I mean, I, I know one, one thing that I do is often, like you said, offering to help before mm -hmm. asking yeah. for anything else. It's like seeing how, what you can do for other people. Uh, but what what is your uh, how do you kind of build a process out of this? Yeah, that one is is different for every person. You yeah. know, what works for me is going to be very different for what works for other people. Some people do really well with automation. Yeah, I'm not great at it. That's a system that I'm not <laughs> not super capable at yet. Sure. Still learning in bits and pieces. For me, um, when I'm speaking in new cities or I'm traveling around, I do keep a pretty solid social media presence with people, and I let people know where I'm going to be. And if they are in that city, maybe it's a chance for us to reconnect. Right. I do try and keep uh, sort of like bullet points in my mind about different people and what's important to them or what they're working on. Yeah. And one of the, the sort of easiest tricks for staying in touch without necessarily being like, I need you to do something for me, is articles. I read all the time, and I see something that reminds me of somebody. I just fire it off really quickly. It's a nice little touch point yeah. for them to know that sometimes they pop up in my head. Yeah. Um, there is, it is a challenge, especially when you meet tons and tons of people to hit every single person. Yeah. And I think it's another pressure release for me is to just say, you'll get some of them and sometimes you won't. And it's okay as you sort of stumble through yeah. how, what is my system? How do I put that in place? So if you, if you remember somebody, then you're meant to connect with them in that moment. And if you don't, you might be, uh, you might get them at some point in the future, but don't stress out about it too right. much. And also remembering that sometimes people connect initially and then for some reason, there's no longer a reason to connect yeah. and yeah. that's okay. And that's fine. And sometimes it will go, you'll go seven years and then something will circle back around and they'll either see some sort of post you made or they'll happen to be in the same city and they'll be like, oh my God, I, now it's the perfect time. Right. And so I, I sort of leave that up to, I won't say like leave it to the universe because that feels a little inactive, but there definitely is a piece of like things will happen when they are supposed to. Right. Um, you know, I, I gave a TED talk last year and the way that I got that was I had been networking with a woman who was in an industry that had nothing to do with what I did. She was okay. in food and beverage. Yep. We had sort of seen each other in different events, sort of the entrepreneurial world in DC, never had a way to work together, kind of liked each other, you know, enjoyed each other, thought we, they were good, sure. good people. You are good. I am good, but there's nothing to do here. Yep. She happened to see a show that I directed uh, at the uh, DC French Festival. Okay. And then she came up to me and said, hey, my partner runs TEDx Mid-Atlantic. We've wanted to do an immersive theater piece. I loved your show. Nice. Would you direct it? And this is two and a half, three years after I had first met her with no intention of how it would shake out. So for me, I just like, if you leave that person feeling good uh, with a positive experience with you, sure. and then you pop back up in their, their brain space later, you're yeah. super likely to, to reap any type of benefit, but you never know what it's gonna be. Cool, cool. Let's talk a little bit about um, so how physical uh, showing up and how like physical cues and like things that you can use uh, help sure. or talisman. Some people call them things like that. Oh yeah. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, you know our audience can't see you, but you have a very well kept, uh, you know, impressive beard. You have a, you have a wooden bow tie. <laughs> I and, enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. You have a wooden bow tie. You have a uh, polka dot uh, uh, handkerchief mm -hmm. and. Uh, and and unicorn cufflinks. Yeah, Those unicorn, are the secret you ones. do yeah. have unicorn cufflinks, which I hadn't right? noticed yet, yeah, but here we go. And, and, <laughs> and awesome socks. So you definitely put yourself out there in a way that is, uh, that is powerful, mm -hmm. that can communicate something, uh, and that makes you stand out, right? So I think a lot of times uh, we were taught you know, in school as kids that you have to fit in, you have to be a part mm -hmm. of the system. And unfortunately, I think that you know, kind of continues to go happen for many people's sure. entire lives, mm -hmm. where you end up uh, you know, working to fit in. Um, as you can tell, I haven't really, <laughs> I don't subscribe to that school <laughs> thought, but many people do. 
Uh, how do you think about that? And how do you think about the impact that you have on other people with the choices that you make of, of how, you know, how you present yourself and what you wear? Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a two-parter there. One, like being authentic and, and being who you are at sort of like your best version. Uh, and, and two, just the talisman type thing. I love that terminology. I've never used that, but I'm going to take that. And yeah, I actually just learned this morning from, oh, from the woman that did the, uh, she was wearing a red suit and she mm-hmm. was talking like, about, she was talking, she implies she was talking about power suits. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Is it, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the, the bow tie is, is a good one. What I do, and I think it's something that you can be responsible for when you go out, have either, you know, I have a couple pieces, but if you have one thing that's easy to comment on, yeah. the beard sometimes works, you know, depending on, you know, at a marketing conference, a tech conference, it's not as big of a standout. But when I'm in more of like an accounting firm, yeah. it's definitely something different. The bow tie gets a lot of attention. Yep. Uh, so it, it just gives you something that people can easily talk to you about. And I think that you don't have to... Um, focus too much on it but it is helpful to give somebody give people something to mention because yeah. no one knows how to break in and it's really easy to say like oh i like your socks yeah i like your shirt i like that bow tie your beard looks great whatever you know some sort of like yeah. not creepy compliment works yeah you know you don't go too far down the compliment route you don't like your hair smells nice but you, <laughs> <laughs> you go down the the compliment space where you're like oh like that thing that you're wearing is good i like your shoes you know i often sure. go to shoes like uh, sometimes I do drag, and so I see a woman in heels, and I'm like, yes, you're killing that one. There you <laughs> so go. nice job. Uh, the other piece is the authenticity side of okay. things. Um, you know, authentic connection, which is what I talk about in, in my networking uh, workshops, is is challenging because we are nervous to be authentic. We, we get used to sort of, especially in a networking situation, kind of peacocking around, like, these are my accomplishments. These are the things that I have done. This is why you should talk to me. This is why I'm worth your time. Sure. And when we use those as sort of the markers, if someone looks at that and says, oh, I think that's dumb, you can say, oh, well, that's not me. That's my accomplishment. That's something that I put out there. It's, a, it's sort of a false bravado. Mm. So if someone comes at us and, and judges what we put out there, we can always say, oh, that's not me. So it doesn't hurt. But right. if you put out an authentic you and you say, hey, here's me, like, you know, Brene Brown, one of the speakers yesterday, who's just my professional crush and I adore. Mm-hmm. She talked about a strong back and a soft front. And wild heart, I believe, was the was the third one. But that strong back, soft heart, or soft front, really stands out to me as as the best way to network. It gives you you know the core of who you are, and you know what your boundaries are, and you know what you're willing to do and not willing to do. Yeah. But you're also open to people seeing you and seeing the different sides of you, and not having to feel like you have to be something for that person. Like who do I need to be to impress that person, as opposed right. to who actually am I? And if we can answer who am I yeah. in a space, it's more powerful and people have something to actually connect with and to latch on to. And also knowing you're not going to please everybody. Right? Yeah. yeah. I just Self-selection gr- is great. Yeah, yeah. I just read a great, a, a, a great uh, it was somebody's Instagram description that said, I'd rather be uh, somebody's shot of whiskey than everybody's cup of tea. Oh, yep. I have a friend who has that same sort of saying. Yeah. 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 And it's, I think I think there's some truth to that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Let's help me out a little bit. Uh, so let's go a little bit deeper into this whole idea of, of uh, peacocking. Because in some ways, you could interpret like maybe wearing a you know mm-hmm. a wooden bow tie or you know like this denim jacket that I right. have with patches or like something like that with as a form of peacocking, right? So where do you draw a line? How do you see that as an expression of individuality versus like peacocking? And how do you think about that? Because that's, that's there's subtleties in there. You're mm-hmm. talking about like people. How do you are, how do you put your because when people accomplish things, o- oftentimes it's hard to how do people basically portray that without Mm -hmm. going over sounding like a jerk about it yeah (laughs) yeah so help us out with that Uh, i mean for the let's use the bow tie as the example let's keep going on that one so it would be the difference between i wear bow ties because i like how they look i think they work with my face like i've just always had kind of an inkling towards them and i like that style and it is a little different it's like not everybody does it especially the wooden but you know it is something that i actually connect with and that i i would wear whether or not you were here and so i wear these not necessarily only to big events like this, but this is just like a part of what I like to do as my style. Sure thing. Um, it's not always this fan, like this is a very fancy version of me today. I'm in a suit that's, you know, a nice suit and all that sort of thing, but, and that's not normally how I dress outside, but there, there are different levels of authentic self and what is the side that you're showing right now? You know, what have people earned to, to see right now and what are they ready for? Uh, so I would say if, if you wear a bow tie because you heard some guy on a podcast do it and he said, that was a good idea and that's going to get people to talk to you, then that's kind of peacocking. Okay. That's you saying like, I will take this accessory and use it as a tool. And I heard that it was good and it doesn't really match me and I don't really connect with it, but here it is. Yeah. Uh, and, but if it's something that you're like, Oh, like I'd have never worn a bow tie out because I thought you weren't supposed to, but I really love it. 
and you want to try it that way, then that's yeah. that's more personal style and uniqueness as opposed to peacocking. And there is there is a middle ground. You can always try things out. Yeah, right? absolutely. It's, it's okay to wear a bow tie a couple of times yeah. and decide that it, like, oh, it, this isn't my that it wasn't yeah. your thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I actually love bow ties. I, I wear tie to tie bow ties when I go to weddings. Oh, yeah, yeah, like that. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm a huge, huge fan. No, but, I love uh, them. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let's talk a little bit. So, I, it's really intriguing what you said about uh, this. I, I wasn't here. We I flew in. Uh, I was in Chile. I flew in yeah. uh, to Boston yesterday. So, I, w- I wasn't able to make it to that talk. But the, the whole idea of a strong back and a soft front. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you say no? How do you, I, part of having a strong back is the idea that uh, sometimes you have to say no. Mm-hmm. How do you manage that in the context of, of forging relationships and, and uh, networking? I think it's setting up as early as you can in the relationship, whenever it makes sense. You know, you don't walk in with a list of like, these are things I will do and these are things I will not do. But sure. as you start uh, seeing like, this might be a professional relationship that I'm cultivating right now, being able yeah. to say like, here's kind of how I interact in that space. And these are the ways that I, I do that. Sometimes it's a learning experience too. And I always sort of ask myself, what would I do that in service of? Is it more in service of me trying to make that person feel good about me or does it actually have a benefit to me and to them? You know, you're always trying to create a win-win situation when you're networking with people. It's not always about, is that person going to be my client? Can I use them to get somewhere? Do they have access to something I want? If you can actually create that win-win between you and them, I think that that's a more powerful place for you to for you to go with okay, it. Let, let's get let's go and let's get a little bit more detail with that. So what what yeah. does that what does that mean? In like, a, let's give a specific example of that. Um, let's see. So a win-win. You know, if I'm looking at networking and relationship build, so as it's a term that I'm starting to get comfortable with since I run a networking event, but it's taken a while to step into it as the idea of being a connector. So for me, one of the things that when I meet somebody out in the world, whether they're going to be a client or a collaborator or whatever, one of the things that I always provide is I have connections to people that could be beneficial to them. So when they meet me, the win for them is they get connections to these other people. I expand my network as well by meeting the right people and by interacting with them and leaving them feeling good and them feeling and me feeling good about them. There's sort of an inherent win-win in networking when it is authentic. And I think maybe that's something that, that I could dig into more on my in my own like research is is authentic networking inherently a win-win? And when I talk about creating a win-win with people, I'm almost coming at it from the old school idea of what what it means to network and and create something there. So I think that making sure that you know that you walk away with a benefit as opposed to just I am serving you or you are serving me. So client connection, even like fun, you know, recommendations. Like yeah. one of the things that I find most impactful, I travel a lot, is by meeting so many people, I have an insider guide all over the place. So yeah. just making sure that you walk away with both of you being enriched from the interaction. That, that's really interesting. How do you think about power imbalances? So one of the things that's really interesting, especially, uh, I don't know if you have any uh, experience with improv theater. Is oh, yeah. like the, the experience <laughs> of... <laughs> TBD know, immersive is mostly improv. Yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. you get onto the other person <laughs> and you, the, the, the idea of playing up and playing down and how one of them is not necessarily better than the other one. It just, sure. it just is. How do you think about all these, th- all these dynamics, the win-win... Uh, networking and, and <coughs> in the context, both in the context, uh, uh, some. I mean, it's it's easier to think about it when you meet somebody who is roughly equal in power sure. to you. Mm-hmm. How do you think about these things where you are in a position, and we all are, regardless of who you are, you know, if Barack Obama were to play one on one with Michael Jordan, right, he yeah. would be in a you know down like mm-hmm, position, mm-hmm. even though he's a pre- former president of the United right. States, right? So, and we all like this is not a judgment. We all have times when we're playing up and playing down. Mm-hmm. It's just life. So how do you think about all these uh, networking concepts and when, when, when you're playing, let's say you are in a position of power mm-hmm. and versus in a position when you're not in a position of power? Well, let's, let's use your Obama-Jordan yeah. uh, metaphor there. So, you know, it, playing a basketball game, absolutely. Obama's probably going down <laughs> in that one. I, yeah. I love you, but you're probably not going to do it. Uh, but being able for him to say, well, what can I contribute to Jordan like what is the thing that it's not in this like right now like if we were having like a basketball tutorial I will be the recipient of most of that so I will get the benefit of him being a better basketball player than me and if you said well now make me a better basketball player too Obama's not really going to be able to do that but what can he do that's in his strength world what can he do that's in his unique uh, value that he can give to that person so if you're you know negotiating up with somebody and that can be a challenge if you're especially coming at somebody from I want a mentor or you're a CEO and I want to talk to you those can be challenging places to find what is the value that I can add to them sometimes that's as easy as what can I take off of your plate 
What is something that I can just send out immediately that's like, hey, knowing all the things that I know about you, here's something that I've seen that, you know, this might be helpful. I put this together for you. Yeah. And sometimes that comes across as needy and sometimes it doesn't. And if it's an authentic piece to you to put something like that together, then share it out there. And if they if they don't connect with it, then that person's probably not somebody that that you need to be interacting with necessarily. You know, keep trying if, if it's a really valuable connection for you. But at some point you do hit a, an end point where you go, you know what? So where's the sucking up line here? Like, <laughs> oh, I'm serious. This, yeah, is, yeah. this is really interesting to think about. Like, so when, you know, let's say that you have a, you're in a, in a, in a very, uh, there's a tremendous gap in power and you're mm -hmm. in a down position. Mm -hmm. And, um, in the, you know, where do you draw the line between adding value and then like boot licking, sucking up and like just being annoying? I mean, think about, you know, is it, is it something that you uniquely want to do anyway? Yeah. Or is it, is it, I would probably go with intention on that. You can do the exact same thing. Like if I put together a, a presentation for a CEO, I can do it from a place of like, I'm just sucking up and I hope that you like this. Or I can do this from a place where I actually think this has an impact on a company or a market or a community that I care about. Uh, so it, it's a little easier if you have something a little mission driven in that, like a nonprofit. And you say, hey, I put this together. I think it's going to make an impact on the people that you serve. You can still do that in a corporate setting, but I think it is where is my intention and is my intention more on I'm going to use this thing to get what I want. Hopefully you get that, but I think it's one of those things where you have to be uh, disconnected from the result. You have to do the thing with the hope that maybe it creates something that you want, but if you can uh, avoid being too connected to the result there, then it's uh, it's less bootlicker and right. more I actually just want to contribute right. so this owning, to the owning the process is something that is authentic to you mm -hmm. regardless of the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's really interesting. Okay, cool. Let's talk a little bit. So, uh, what is? Talk to me about your theater uh, business. So what is? What is that? What is that? Sure. <laughs> what does that do? It's been a weird month. Um, so, I've done theater for most of my life. I majored in it in, in undergrad. Cool. I was a actor, director, teacher. Kind of bounced around and did a lot in in the theater world. And then it sort of moved into more of a uh, a, a passionate hobby. You know, still professional work, still working very intently with with professional artists, but not a full time job I would do you know direct a friend show every year or, or stay involved in the scene in some way and uh, when Ted approached me to do the immersive piece that sort of reignited a lot of things in immersive work um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with it I, I was gonna ask you I, 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 I at the risk of sounding like, yeah, no, like, no. <laughs> like, a, like a dummy I do like, not oh, know what immersive yeah. theater no is, totally so, so <laughs> immersive theater uh, the sort of like uh, poster child for it right now is in yep. New York it's a, a show called sleep no more and it's basically you walk into the, the world. They've created this huge hotel space. And once you step into the world, every character within is someone that you can sort of interact with or watch and follow at your own pace. So rather than, say, a musical where you watch the king, you know, up there with his queen and they have a fight scene and they run off, you can follow the king off. You can follow the queen off. You can stay with the prince who remains on stage. You get to control where you go and what stories you follow. And so there's not a traditional linear arc necessarily for you as an audience member there is as a character each character has their own arc that they go through but you decide where you are so for this one it's called in cabaret we trust and it's set in a 15,000 square foot desanctified church that's covered in art and, and murals and graffiti this is in dc mm -hmm. yeah i got I, this, it's awesome. I, am yeah. Very <laughs> I am very compelled yeah. I, yeah i yeah i need to go there it's it's great we close thursday friday so i have to fly back on thursday to get back but we are remounting uh in the dupont underground like i said in february february okay mm -hmm. yep uh, and so basically you go in and in, in this, once we open, once you come into the gate, you're set in a, a cabaret in 2027 that follows sort of a nationalistic, populistic line. Wow. Assuming that like sort of a handmaiden's tale, like what happens if we keep going down that path type of thing. Sure. And so there's been a DC revolt and there were wars internally and now the resistance cabaret is there sort of standing. I'm at getting the end. goosebumps. Yeah, no, I want to go, go see the show. <laughs> it's so cool. Check out tbdimmersive.com. You can okay. watch a little uh, a trailer on it there. Okay. Uh, but you know, we have anywhere from in on a low night, I think we have 28 performers and on a high night about 40. And wow. so there are burlesque artists, pole performers, aerialists, acrobats, jugglers, improvisers, you know, traditionally trained actors, all that sort of thing. And they're all inhabiting the space. 
Uh, there are puzzles for you to figure out throughout the evening. There are different interactions that if you are in the wrong place at the wrong time, you won't get. You'll miss all sorts of things when you go. Uh, you, in order to see every interaction, you'd have to see the show seven times. Seven times? I yeah. was going to ask you, you could go ten times and yeah. see different yeah, shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you would still, even if you came seven times, you would, the improvised pieces, they are in, you know, the improvised team, we call them the fabric cast. Yeah. And they are anywhere from 12 to 18, I think, on our highest night. And those people just live there. Yeah. There's no plot line necessarily. They have objectives. They know who they are in the world. They know who they relate to. But every night would be totally different. So you could spend a night with each one of those people and get a totally different story every time that's awesome so yeah immersive work is is a big passion of mine and, and my creative team and we were awarded a grant uh for the space and we got the grant uh maybe 60 days ago congratulations and thank you yeah and so we had 42 days to write produce cast market direct all of those things to get this show up and running and so wow you know, what, are you, what are you doing here you i know exactly <laughs> well I, I booked this way before <laughs> yeah and so i was like oh, i have to keep going to this and so yeah i mean this is our last week with with this one but okay. the remount is super exciting and we're we've learned a ton awesome. about how to handle immersive work and the reason that it's not super common is because y there's no guidebook there's no this is how this should work out and to train someone up on immersive theaters is challenging the only way to get good at it is to do it yeah. so here we are doing it and we're learning a lot and it's gone really well but we assume that February is going to be even better. That's awesome. What are some of the skills that transfer from immersive theater to this whole world of networking? So I had a guest on the show um, from Four Hour Weekend, mm -hmm. which is an improv uh, show in uh, Fort Worth, mm -hmm. Texas. And they just they just came up with a book uh, where they talk about the power of yes and yep. you know about in, oh, in, yeah. in everyday mm -hmm. life. What are some ways in which your work with immersive th uh, theater uh, bleeds over into this idea of networking and how you do that without being an asshole? Yeah. I, it, theater to me is is cultivated empathy yeah. with others it's shared experience uh, one of the things that i like the most about immersive th theater in general but immersive theater even more so is sort of how um how quickly it disappears you know it's sandcastles on the water type thing you you do a show and it will never be the same ever again even when it's the same storyline yep. you know Mike dropped a, a prop earlier and like that was that will only happen in that show and the people in the audience are the only ones who got to see that and so that sort of ethereal nature of theater is something that really attracts me to it and it's similar to conferences and things like this like mm -hmm. it's only going to happen this one time Brene Brown's probably you know I'm seeing her um, October 1st in DC and I got those yeah. tickets before I booked this and so I can't wait to see it again it may be the same talk but it'll be different happening in DC than it is happening here well, and you don't know what she ate for breakfast today exactly or yeah what happened and live music the same way mm -hmm. I, I play a little blues yeah and absolutely a lot of times it's like very even if you play the same song yeah and so to me like that's the the thing that that theater really gives you is it gets you used to sort of like building those sandcastles in the water and just being okay with like and then that gets destroyed yeah. and so you're here at this conference and you know some people saw my presentation other people saw others like the people that were in mine will share that experience in a way that other people won't and there's so many things yeah. happening right now. So we, this is basically, actually life is immersive. Oh theater. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, that's, if, if, you get, <laughs> if, if we're going to draw that parallel, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If you get there, I mean, yeah, it's a very Zen way to think about things yeah. and like the impermanence and non-attachment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, let's share with our audience your links again. So sure. it's the, uh, your, your, the business is, uh, uh, but I'm a unicorn damn it, which is unicorn damn it dot com. Okay. D A M M I T. Okay. There's Network Under 40 DC. Uh, we're in multiple cities across the U.S., but for the DC one, it's networkunder40.com. Yep. And then TBD Immersives is the theater company. That's TBD, tradition be damned, immersive.com. Okay, and that is going to open in DC again in February. February, yep. Okay, mm -hmm. so people can start lining up for tickets. And yeah, I'm going to start do. getting yeah. my, my plane ticket. Is there anything else that you want our audience to know about you? Uh, I, th I think you've covered it. I'm, <laughs> I'm all over the place. And I, I guess that's one of the... I was watching a talk from Elizabeth Gilbert, and she talked sure. about... Uh, jackhammer careers versus hummingbird careers and that resonated so much with me because to me it's always just been sort of like you're unfocused and you're a cluster cuss and like everything you do nothing I, seems to I feel like that too yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like and I think that people always feel like oh I wish I would find that one thing yep. and you know in the, even in the with this theater company coming together now and with my coaching practice and my speaking practice and my training and all of these sort of different things I was a massage therapist I was a segue tour guide for a while I worked at the spy museum I was a teacher I was in tech. I was in healthcare. I've done all of these different things. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're about as much of a weirdo as I am. Yeah, that's I'm great. a weirdo. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> and I think that it's like, you know, being able to, the authenticity piece is, is like every time, every step I've taken, yeah. even if it was outside of the normal thing, felt authentic in that moment and something that I should pursue. And, it, okay. you know, you, hindsight's twenty twenty, as they as they say, and there's sure. no way you know where all of this 
congealed. So if you feel like a drifter, you're not sure, like you just haven't found the one thing yet, you'll continue. I think I will continue to find the one thing and who knows how long I'll run a theater company and what will be after that. But all of these things, that hummingbird career, as she mentioned, like you're cross pollinating all of these different in industries with a background that's not traditional. Yeah. And you might feel like you're a mess, but you can use that as the, the unique thing that you bring into the that space. Right. So me coming into healthcare, uh, which I'm no longer in anymore, but when I was, the background of theater, the background of customer yeah. service, the background of experience design, the background, all of these different things yeah. really make you a, a really unique presence in that. Yeah. And once you're over that hurdle of convincing someone that you can get that job or have that client, it's actually a really huge distinguishing factor for you. So like, go for it. <laughs> There's your next book. It's yeah, I like, know, right? It's yeah. like, uh, how to make ADD a feature, not a bug. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure to have you on the show. So nice to be here. Thanks. Right, nice to meet you. Thank you for listening to Small Business War Stories. If you enjoy the show, share it with a friend, or you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our blog at blog.proven.com. If you have an idea for us, we'd love to hear it. Please email us at podcast at proven.com. See you next time. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. <laughs>